Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Tosh Customs, and today we'll be looking at my custom Mezco Jedi figure. Um, I believe the era he sits in is like Old Republic era, which I realize is like sort of non-canon now, but anyways, still very cool. And this was an incredible figure to make, and I'm really, really stoked to bring him to you. Um, we're going to start off with the accessories first, as we always do, and then we'll get into the actual figure himself, which I think is a pretty complex little guy over here. So we're going to set him off to the side, and let's look at everything he comes with. I realize you can't see everything on the camera. Some of the hands down here are a little bit blocked off by the edge, but it's okay. We'll, we'll look into them. So... Um, we're going to start with the accessories, so not the hands, but we're going to start off with the weapons. So um, he has this blaster, which um, I got from a Luke Skywalker figure. Uh, very, very simple. I dry brushed it with the black or gray um, just to help bring out some of the details in there. Very simple. I know he's a Jedi, so he doesn't necessarily need a blaster, but I also figured it's a fun little thing to have. Our sort of theme with this guy is... Um, sort of like a ragtag survivor Jedi, like he was left for dead, you know, out the end of a battle type thing, and now he is tracking it on his own. So he's, he's carrying a blaster with him now, he's added it to his arsenal. Along with that, he has his own lightsaber and then a lightsaber from a fellow fallen Jedi. Um, the customer wanted to go with white sabers. Um, I decided, and I talked to him, and we decided not to make it fully white. The only reason being that if it gets fully white, you lose that transparent nature of the blade. And so instead I speckled them with white, um, just with an airbrush. And so obviously one was just a lighter color blue than the other, but we do have these two blades with um, white on them and white in them. So that's pretty cool. So he has two lightsabers that he's carrying and I do have storage for all um, his weapons, which is pretty cool. Uh, the next thing we're gonna look, at, look at is I did make this little backpack for him. Um, and I'll do, I'll do a breakdown right now for it. So obviously there's just a lot of internal elastic here. So we're going to look away from the ugly side and look to the pretty side. Obviously, you know, once again, he's a, he's a survivor of a battle. So everything's dirty. Everything's rugged. This was a plate from a Titanfall figure. I forget which one, but I trimmed a lot of the edges down and whatnot so that it would be able to fit the size of this backpack in this actual backpack piece, like the actual plastic frame, is from DTG Figures. I, he, since he custom makes a, and prints a lot of Star Wars stuff, I did get a lot of parts from him, and so this backpack's one of those pieces, or just like the base piece for it. Um, I added these elastic straps, and I just added some little extra bits hanging off the back there. He does have a loop right here, this little, this little piece right here. There is that loop for um, one of fits one of his lightsabers, and I'll show you how that storage works in a little bit. Um, and then I also created this bedroll for him that's uh, looped in elastic and attached also by elastic. And this was made from a Kylo Ren robe that I had laying around, and I sprayed it brown, as you guys can see there. It's not black, it's brown. It's a very dark brown. It looks a little bit better in person. I don't know why the camera's not picking up that contrast, but you can see the difference in tone just slightly. Um, and then obviously I painted up the whole backpack and all this whole back plate and stuff. So added some little green and red little buttons in there, as well as we added some red in there. And then also just some silver and some gunmetal gray and obviously just a lot of dirt and whatnot onto this backpack to make it feel worn down. So we got that and just doing a lot of weathering on this guy and it was really fun. Uh, yeah, because I don't, a lot of times the figures I'm making are just very clean or the weathering that they do have is just like a tiny bit of dirt or a tiny bit of metal scratching. But I mean, this guy has been through war, so definitely able to make him a lot grimier than I normally do. Um, so we're just going to talk about the hands. We're using the blade hands for the figure. That's really all that needs to be said, but I'm going to give you a look at two different hands here. We have his right hand, and this is all done in a gloss black, which then is also dry brushed with a black gray. As you can see there, you can see some uh, gray highlights sitting up top. And then we have his left hand here, also done in a gloss black with a dry brush of black gray, but he has a white armor plating here, and we'll see why in a little bit. But it's it's white armor plating, um, dry brush with a little bit of black gray over top too to bring out just some dirt, some grime in there. And so he has all his hands from Blade, and we're just gonna shove them to the back. There, there, you'll get to see him more in pictures. I will say, I like some of Blade's um, sort of like more expressive hands 
because these are some really, really fun force hands, like having him try to like mind control someone or push someone and then also having him like crushing someone, stuff like that. Just some really, really cool stuff with the hands and I dig it a lot. So I'm glad that that figure comes with them. And the reason I chose Blade is, um, I talked about it in my Arkham Knight review, but Blade is one of those few figures who I consider has what I call like universal hands. And what I mean by that is he has double trigger hands he has his fists, he has his expressive ones, as well as he has double grasping hands for swords. He get he has everything covered in terms of expressiveness, um, in term and also in terms of like hands for actual utility of using weapons and whatnot. So I love Blade for that. I also love the Sovereign Knight figure base for that. Um, so now we've covered the accessories on a very, very just sort of brushing over the top level. We're going to get into the character now because this guy has a lot to him. There's a lot of depth in him and I'm excited to break all of this down for you. So where do we even begin? I um, guess we're going to start with the head. We're actually going to pop this head off so you guys can take a look-see at it. Also, uh, actually, I'll talk about it in the body section. We're just going to put that off to the side. This is our Zabrak head sculpt and my golly, I think it's beautiful. Um, I got it from, I think it's Kessel Run or Kessel Races on eBay. He 3D prints these. Um, this is not a knock against him. Mine did smell a little bit like cigarette smoke when I got it. So um, I did wash the head um, afterwards and just sort of let it air out for like a day or two in my garage. Just so that it didn't uh, smell gunky. But I'm just going to toss that out to you guys. Um, a little little smelly. No, but the, the sculpt itself is great. So... That's just more of a that's more of a buyer's warning. Nothing against him. He shipped great. Everything. He's he's a great guy. Just know that the products might have uh, a smell with it. Um, besides that, though, the the sculpt is absolutely beautiful. Um, all the little tattoos and stuff actually had lines within the sculpt, so it was very easy to see and paint. The big challenge for this guy was getting this very orange tone. And if I don't, hopefully the camera picks it up. I added a lot of depth in the skin tone. There's a, you know, there, there's many shades running through this guy here. And so, um, yeah. And then even, you know, even getting sort of like this darker brownish red tone for, you know, sort of like the different colors on his face. As, and then I used brown, like a leather brown for the lines. But all this kind of stuff was just, I had to mix a lot of colors. There's a lot of trial and error to get this depth to it. I didn't want him to look flat. I feel like Star some Star Wars characters in costume and stuff like that look a little flat. You know, Darth Maul is just red and just black. But for him, I want to actually have depth. And so you can see that we have some shadow around the eyes. We have a different tone for the lips. We have, you know, even within, you know, these tattooed areas, there's actually a depth of color to it. And then for the horns also, they fade from a brown to a black gray on the tips. Um, hopefully that shows through on camera. I feel like the camera's mostly picking up black gray, but in hand for like the lower half of these, there's actually more of a brown tone to them. And then obviously around where the horns protrude, we also have just some little differences in paint color as the skin's been raised. So just focusing on a lot of detail. Along with that, obviously he made it out of a battle. So um, my cast actually came with, or my printer cast actually came with the ear a little chipped. But that's okay because we, we even before I got the set sculpt, we're going for a battle damaged version. So I added just a little bit of red on the ear there. You know, maybe he, he just got skimmed by a laser blast or got cut lightly. And obviously we have a lot more um, scarring and cuts around the face and added a little bit more red on the right side as, or his left side as well. So we got all that. I'm just super proud of this face. And um, I was also painted the eyes in there. He's got a nice green in his eyes as well as uh, black gray pupils. So just a super, super fun head sculpt, honestly. It, it took me a while. I think I spent about like two hours painting this head, maybe even a little bit more, because there's just a lot of paint mixing and testing out tones, but it came out beautifully and I'm just super, super happy with it. I don't, I don't think I could have done better. I, I love this head sculpt. It's, and I love the paint on it. It's great. Um, so now turning to the actual figure. Um, the customer, he actually had a Gomez body. So we are actually using the um, the Stealth Ops. I think that's what it is, the Stealth Gomez. So he has, you know, more black combat pants. He's got sort of like this black turtleneck and it was a great base for the version of the Jedi we were going for. 
I'm not an incredible Star Wars nerd, but he sent me some reference photo of a Jedi with a blue robe. And I really like this. I really, really like this color scheme. So um, I got this Darth Maul robe. Um, it was wired, thank goodness. And so that helps with the shape of the hood and a lot of other things. But then um, cut up and tattered the, the robe itself. And then I also cut off the sleeves and then as you'll see here, we also just sort of folded in the edges of the robe right there and just glued those down. First of all, the backpack and the hood cover it, so that's not a big deal, but that also makes the robe around the shoulders be a lot more fitted. It's a lot less poofy, and so it holds to his frame a little bit more, and so you get more of an idea of his size. Um, also, I love the Gomez body because it is the only smaller type body that Mezco has made that includes double jointed elbows. The Joker and the Punisher figures and the John Wick figures, none of them use double jointed elbows. And so I super, super dig that uh, we're able to take advantage of that joint system there. I, I know some people have commented for me to talk more about articulation. The only reason I just generally choose not to is we use a base figure quality. So if you really want to know articulation, um, you know, just check out an actual review for the figure. However, um, I will say for all my customs articulation is something that's super important to me. And so I always consider articulation in the design of these characters. Um, no figure that I've made ever has suffered or has had articulation suffered due to the changes I've made, whether it be sculpting, whether it be cloth work, um, anything. I always make sure their articulation is preserved. So um, with that, yeah, um, even though he has his robe armor and he has his chest plate, he's still able to do his bend and everything like that. He's still able to lean back so, you know, I have preserved articulation on this guy, you know, just as a demonstration. Also, yeah, he can still move his shoulders all the way up, even with the shoulder pad, stuff like that. He has no issues. He can kick all the way forward. I guess I'm just doing an articulation breakdown since I talk, started talking about it. But yeah, so clearly I've preserved everything. I just want to throw that out there for just sort of reviews past and reviews to come. Um, I always make sure I preserve articulation in every way, shape, and form. So... Um, with that, let's get into the actual breakdown of this guy. So he's a survivor. So along with that, we decided to add a scarf. This was also sort of in the concept art he sent me. And so we have a scarf here. Um, I just took some fabric I had, cut it into the shape I wanted it to be, layered it down the way I wanted, and then sprayed it brown, a leather brown. I used Angelus leather paint. Um, and I did also use Angelus leather paint for um, his robe here. I sprayed it with uh, navy blue because the robe was initially black. And then also around the bottom, um, you know, frayed edges, I also sprayed brown to get sort of some dirt, some mud in there. That's how we did that. Um, the chest plate here, this is the ARC Trooper chest plate. I don't know why it's sort of like, looks like it's leaning over. There we go, it's straight. Uh, we have the, oh, I realize it's because this scarf leans off to the side, so it makes this look off-centered. It's lined up. Um, <laughs> but we have the ARC Trooper chest plate here. We have a knee pad here. We have a Republic shoulder pad. We also have a gauntlet here, as well as our shin guards, and as well as the back, oops, geez, I knocked my camera, as well as the backpack mentioned earlier. All of them are from, let me straighten my camera a little bit. There we go. All of them are from DTG figures. He makes excellent stuff. Um, he's the only one I know, and I'm sure there are others, but he's the only one I know who makes generally Star Wars themed stuff. And so he was the first one I went to, especially for some of these armor plates, you know, that you really can't get from figures. So my first choice, I also did re, um, repurpose. That's the word I was looking for. I was like, it's a, it's an RE word. I did repurpose a shoulder pad from DTG. And I'll talk about how I was able to sort of manipulate the plastic a little bit, but I actually did a lot of sanding on his work. And just to, just to throw it out there, if you have 3d printed parts, um, you can sand them down to a degree, you know, Obviously note that 3D printed parts are generally and largely a much tougher, harder plastic. And so they have less give, they will crack. So um, be careful with that. But I was able to sand down the gauntlet here, sand down the shoulder pad, um, sand down this, uh, sand down his knee pad that I repurposed as a shoulder pad. Um, all of those I was able to sand down to get them to fit better. And then actually because this plastic was so thin, I was actually able to heat it up with my heat gun and actually flex the sides out a little bit so it fit his shoulder better before it sat a little too tight. And so it sort of like rose up on the shoulder, but um, I widened it down and then it was able to sit flush and flat. So that's just something to throw out. You are able to manipulate 3D printed parts, but uh, do so at your own risk 
and really don't push the limits if you're feeling unsafe with it. So we've covered the robe, we've covered some of the armor. There's just a lot of weathering paint and I'm super, super happy with how it turned out. Uh, the Republic symbol I painted in, I dirtied everything up and then I painted it in just a very rough red and then also hit it with a little bit of gloss so that, you know, it's clearly dirty. It's, you know, it's clearly like scuffed up and whatnot, but we also do have sort of like the finish of the way it used to look. And then all, we have all these like little blue light areas and all of those are hit with a gloss, uh, with. Um, a light blue, like a sky blue, and then also ran with gloss over, so they actually do look like little glowing bits. And you can see we even have it in the shoulder pad there. So, we got all that. Um, I utilize a lot of elastic in this figure. We have elastic on the shoulder pad here, and I did two types of elastic for this shoulder pad here. Um, well, I have different measurements of elastic in general, and we'll talk about that, but I also, I put elastic around the shoulder, um, around the arm here, to secure the shoulder piece in place. But then what I also did um, is I put elastic under the robe and onto the inside of the shoulder pad. And what that allows it to do is it allows it to bring the robe around with it. You'll see that it sort of pulls the robe when we go back down and it moves around. And, what, and that does two things for the figure. One, it keeps the shoulder pad centered to the arm itself. And what I mean by that is that it stays you know, in line with the robe. If it didn't have that when you move the arm or if you flex the arm, especially if you pushed it up, like the shoulder pad wouldn't return to its general same position. I can, you know, I can scoot the shoulder pad up a little bit if I want to, but you know, generally same position, you know, it returns and that's because we have a very tight piece of elastic that's pulling it back. And then the elastic here around the actual arm itself allows it to move along with the arm, you know, when we move it forward and backwards. So that keeps it following and that keeps it all very, very nice and in line. So that's just a fun thing to think about, you know, when you're making your figures is, you know, using elastic to not only just attach things, you know, just wrap, you know, not only to just like wrap knee pads around or create a strap, but also to actually use it to enhance the articulation of the figure. And it gives, you know, yourself or a buyer just something a little less to worry about. The shoulder pad will always stay centered now. He's, you know, he's never going to have to think about it. Um, now talking about sizes of elastic, I have multiple sizes of elastic on this figure based on what I want to do with it. I have a four millimeter um, wide elastic piece right here. And then I'm also like on the inside of the shoulder here, on the knees, I'm using a very, you know, take a look at that. Take a look at that. Take a look at that. Uh, focus. Oh, take a look at that. Take a look at that. Very clearly thinner. I'm using a two millimeter um, on the knee pad as well as on the straps um, for the shin guards. So I'm using different measures of elastic. Uh, you can see the same thing here. I have four millimeter and uh, two millimeter. So um, just sort of bringing different measurements of elastic in to create variance. If everything is the same length, it starts to look a little bit tacky and it's a small detail, but you know, if you guys have seen my other reviews, I believe small details make all the difference. And so having different lengths or having different thicknesses of elastic really, really um, becomes important when you're working with a character like this or just in character design in general. So, um, you know, we've just sort of been moving down the figure. So continuing to move down, I did add um, some fabric in here just sort of as like an inner belt. And, you know, once again, it's about the tiny details. It just adds a little bit more separation. It just adds another layer to the figure. And it also helps make the look, make the robe look like it really got bound together in there along with the belt. So we have that piece of fabric. Um, I actually have my Rorschach figure here. I'm filming all these in quick succession. So we do have the Rorschach figure here. This pattern of fabric is actually what we used here, except we painted it brown and it's also the same as the scarf. I just like it. It's a very thin material and the pattern gives it some depth too. If it was just a flat color, it'd be a little bit boring, but having the pattern gives it some light and dark shadows and just, you know, switches it up a little bit. So we do have that there. You can see some of the pattern coming through. So, you know, just some variance. It makes it interesting. So we got that, you know, you mix materials and patterns to really make a design come out. So um, to the belt itself now, obviously we have the four millimeter elastic running around over the side and over the shoulder, and it's just glued under the belt right there. This is um, blade. This is the belt from the Mezco blade figure. 
Um, we did a lot with this belt. First of all, it's completely repainted. We have black, gray, and some brown on like the actual, you know, plastic strap that runs around. The pouches have now have some black, gray, and some brown as well as some silver detailing in there. You know, as you can see, this pouch is from the um, Arkham Knight Nightwing figure. Um, you can use any pouch you want. You don't have to use that one. This is just one I had sitting around and stylistically, you know, it, it very much fit. So I used it. Um, that's another important thing. When you, when, you, when you mix parts, make sure that the styles generally are similar so that the figure looks cohesive. If I have something that looks a lot more military than these, then they're not look, gonna look like they belong on the same belts. Or you know, if this thing is like, you know, this giant like med, medic pouch or something, or like an ammo carrier, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't match the theme. So just make sure that all your parts fit the general aesthetic of the figure. Um, so these clips right here have been painted in a white. Obviously, the belt has done, been done in a silver and gold. So I used this pouch to cover Blade's little boomerang holster on this end. Um, and then on this end, I took a blaster holster from a Luke Skywalker figure. Um, I cut it off Luke Skywalker's belt. I dremeled it all down and then attached it so that it sits pretty flush with the body, as you can see there. Um, it was painted in, I painted it in a matte black and then dry brushed with a black gray and then dry brushed with a leather brown over that. And so we do get some, if the camera will focus, focus, please. There we go. As you can see, we get some brown tones in there as well, which is just super, super important. Cool. So we've talked about that. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit now. Let's talk about what we have down here. Um, originally, I was going to add thigh armor, and then I just decided against it. He need, Jedis are agile. He needs to be able to flex. He needs to be able to move quickly, so uh, opted out not for the thigh armor. These knee pads are from the Mezco Gambit figure. They are flipped upside down. Very obviously, they have been uh, largely repainted. They're also attached with a 2 millimeter elastic strap right there like so. Um, I had so much fun doing just weathering for this guy. He's got silver, he's got black gray, he's got brown splotching, you know, throughout just for like dirt and mud. Um, coming down to these shin guards, same thing, painted in white, two millimeter. Then we have, you know, our uh, sky blue with gloss, and then we have our silver, our black gray, um, our browns in there to really just add that very dirty, dirty, grimy feeling to it. Uh, something I did do is I thinned out black paint and I actually ran it through all the little cracks of the armor, ran it up there, you know, ran it sort of around the Republic symbol, ran it through a lot of the edges on the gauntlet, as you can see. Um, and all of those things, first of all, it helps bring out the details. When you're weathering something, you want to bring out the little, um, you know, cracks in the details. And I actually detailed the chest plate even beyond what you can see. There's even more detailing like down here, but just the row won't reveal it. Um, but yeah, all, it's really important to accentuate those cracks and stuff because when you're adding a lot of like, you know, brown and silver scratching and whatnot, especially on something that's white, um, you're going to lose a lot of the detail because of that. Like here, like in some of these places, you'd really lose your edge if you didn't have those black lines in there. Like something like right here, you really wouldn't be able to see the rest of it as much, but we do have a black line running through it and that does help. Um, just bring out the details despite the weathering. So just having that darker color underneath the weathering really helps out a lot. And then we come down to our boots. I dry brushed it in black gray and then also splotched it up with a lot, a lot of brown. You know, he's been, he's been running in the mud. He's, he's been, he's been in it, you know? So got some, got some dirty, dirty boots. This guy took a heck of a time to paint. Um, as of filming this review yesterday, I spent... I would say about seven of the nine and a half hours I was working yesterday painting this guy. That both includes the head as well as a lot of the armor weathering and a lot of the detailing. Um, in assembly, this guy wasn't insane. There's a lot of little minute details that took a lot of figuring out. But I mean, there's just a lot of time spent on the detailing of this figure. You know, even painting the hands, the color of the hands are very specific. We painted this white because he has this gauntlet here and we matched this gloss black because he has the gloss black glove there 
Also, we have some, uh, some silver in here, whether you want to believe it's a robotic hand or whatever, I just think it looks cool. And then, you know, just to continue with sort of that brown leather motif, we do have uh, leather brown straps on the arm piece there, on the glove piece there. And this is also from Gambit, by the way, just throwing that out there. Some fun now, let's talk about weapon storage. Obviously, we have the pistol holster here. We're just gonna move this strap up and then slide the pistol in like, oop, why is it stuck? Oh, there it is, like so. Gonna tab that in. I like that there's that little strap with the button there. That's super fun. Um, the next thing we have is I actually drilled a hole through the belt and ran a tiny chain through here. Dude, this took me like 40 minutes because I had to clasp the chain piece with a larger chain, as you can see there. This is that right there. If it focuses, anyways, you can see it. That's a larger loop than the rest of these smaller links. And the reason why I did that is because I didn't want to have like an actual le legitimate large clasp on there because it would sit really large and it would just be really, really obtuse. So um, opted out to not, um, to not have an actual clasp on there and instead clasp it myself. And that took one heck of a time because these links are so small. And so to feed the larger link through the smaller links took a long, long time, but ultimately it was worth it. So we have this uh, loop of chain here. And so all we have to do is just take our lightsaber and I'm gonna, sorry, this might be out of frame real quick because I sort of need both my hands and I need to see it beyond the camera viewfinder. There we go. So you just feed it through there and then you just put it off to the side and you just let it hang there. So we have one of our lightsaber storage right there and it works out really well. So we got that. I'm gonna get them not T-posing anymore. So we have that, gonna stand them all up straight again, make them look cool. There we go. So we have his blaster and his first lightsaber. The, the second lightsaber, gonna pop the blade out again. And then this one, it just feeds right through this loop and it feeds really nicely. And then thankfully we just have this little nub right there that just catches it. So that's how you store it on the backpack. Now, um, obviously we have elastic loops and obviously the loops are very large. And so all you have to do is just pull the figure's arms back. And then you just take the backpack on both ends and you just feed it over, uh, just feed it over and around the figure. Uh, you know, if you've ever had one 12th scale figures before and even one six scale figures, you know, it, application of accessories is all generally the same. So sort of move the arms around and then just feed it over. So there, now, now he's got his backpack straps, you know, over the front of him, as you can see, and he's got his backpack on the back and he has all his weapon storage still. He's got his lightsaber, he's got his blaster, he's got his other saber. Very, very, very cool dude. I love this design a lot and I had such a pleasure um, making him. I think he looks intimidating. He looks rugged. Um, just everything we really wanted him to be. I like, I especially like the robe. The blue robe really sets it off. I'm glad we didn't go for something, you know, more standard and do like a brown or anything like that. I think brown would have just felt a little bit boring, but I really do like the blue and I wish we saw more Jedi in blue. I think it's pretty sick. And I'm really glad we went uh, he, the customer had a Gomez body to base it off of. There we go, just sort of focusing the camera again so it'll brighten up the colors a little bit so you can see it. But, you know, yeah, having that, having that nice black undersuit really, really also um, works with the character a lot, makes a lot of sense. And so, yeah, just a lot of detailing. And I mean, I could go into like every single, oh, I painted this, I painted this, but... You guys get the general gist of it. It took a lot of time and it paid off and I think he just looks so, so dope. So with that being said, I'm gonna put on his, what I'm calling his quote unquote force using hands. Just so that, cause it's just a fun pose and I'll pose him up for the end of the video. But yeah, just a, just a super fun figure to make. There we go, so now we have his force using hands there. Oh, that's so tight. And then obviously his, um, his skirt, the whole robe's on a wire. So you can sort of also bend it up a little bit, flare it up as you will. Come on, that's tight. What, this figure is so cool. I wish I could keep him. I mean, I wish I could keep most of my figures, honestly. 
So many of my figures I fall in love with and I wish I could just display them on my shelf forever. But, man, it's so fun. It's so, so fun. And I'm really, really in love with this guy. Um, it was, I'm really, I think the fun part about this commission especially was that it was such a unique concept. Like I've made Star Wars, figure bef Star Wars figures before and I've, I, I've made, I think I've made quite a few at this point. Not, you know, not outstanding number compared to other people, but I've done my time with it. But I think what was fun about this was, you know, we're not basing this off of anything. This was 100% an original design. And the fun part was the customer really just said, just, just go for it. Just really, really, you know, send it. And I think we did. Um, I'm really, really happy with the layers of this character. Um, I think he feels very built out and I think he looks developed as a character concept. Um, I, I forgot to say it for the same thing in my Arkham, Arkham Knight video, but you know, same thing. The customer said, you know, just full send, go hard with the character design and we'll see what we land with. And so um, I really enjoy commissions like this. It gives me a lot more artistic freedom. And um, I think this character really shines. I'm really, really happy with him. Yeah, I mean, that's all I can say. I'm just really, really happy. I'm just sort of smiling behind the camera right now. He's a, he's a fun guy to look at. He's a fun guy to pose around. I can't wait for you guys to see the pictures of him um, because just some cool shots. He's very fun. I wish I had my um, sort of like fallen Cal Kestis figure still here because then I'd be able to uh, stand them side by side and they'd be, maybe be able to duel or maybe they'd be a team or something. Who knows? But yeah, just the, just the flex room to be creative was really exciting, and I think it turned out really well. So um, otherwise, if I keep going, I'm just going to be rambling. Um, if you guys have any more questions, uh, shoot me a DM. Um, hopefully I explained it uh, large enough to your guys' liking, and hopefully the breakdown of the figure made a lot of sense. But if you guys want to know anything more, just give me a shout on my Instagram. Um, I have my username both in the description of this video down below as well as in as well as I have a link in the about section of my channel and my username on Instagram is Tosh underscore customs that's where you guys can find me I post a lot more not daily but almost daily updates there especially on my story and so you'll be able to see the work in progress for a lot of these characters um, and you'll be able to get hopefully maybe even a little bit more insight into what I'm doing beyond these reviews so uh, with that being said, thank you all for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys, you know, learned something, gained something from it. And if you did, uh, please consider subscribing. Um, also, follow me on my Instagram if you guys want to. I do a lot more stuff there. And I'm always happy uh, to share knowledge and to share experience. I think it's valuable. And um, I just really love the community that's here. So with that... Thank you all so much for watching this review because it is the end of the De it is the end of December. Ugh, got tongue tied there. Um, happy holidays to everyone. I hope you all stay safe and I hope you all have a wonderful um, holiday season. And I will catch you all next time. See you soon.